Thank you, Anne. Welcome to um, those of you who are here in person and the audience that is joining us online. I'm Jeff Kahn. I'm the director of the Berman Institute of Bioethics, and I have the pleasure of um, introducing today's lecture. I will not introduce today's speaker. I will uh, leave that honor for my colleague, Deborah Matthews. But before we get to um, Professor White, I want to say a few words about uh, the name of today's lecture. This is one of the two Hutzler Reeve uh, Memorial Lectures that we do every year. And, and it's important when we do these to take a, a moment and reflect on why it's named as it is. So here's the answer. Eleanor uh, Ellie Trowbridge was a member of the board of the Berman Institute of Bioethics and she cared deeply about palliative care. She devoted uh, much of her time to Johns Hopkins, both as an employee and later as a volunteer. To wit, she served in the Johns Hopkins University Development Office and raised critical support for the Department of Oncology. She also chaired the Bloomberg School of Public Health's Council on Population and Family Growth. And she served as a development consultant for the Children's Defense Fund and Population Action International in her volunteer life. In 2003, on behalf of the university, all those efforts were recognized through uh, a wording to her of the university's Heritage Award for Outstanding Service. Her commitments took on deeply personal significance with the death of her daughter, Sheila Hutzler Reeves who succumbed to breast cancer in 1988. Ellie was a member of the board of the Berman Institute and she'll, she, until she herself passed away in 2007. The semi-annual lecture series, which is named of course, for Ellie's daughter, daughter Sheila, Sheila Hutzler Reeves, pardon me, focuses on longstanding and emerging ethical issues in palliative care. And it would not be possible without Ellie's generosity and that of her family. So we're here today to help realize Ellie's vision and that of this institution to advance palliative care systems and interactions for the benefit of all. Sorry for that somewhat garbled um, overview of the lectureship. Thank you, Doug, for being here. And in order to introduce Doug today, call on my colleague, Deborah Matthews to make that formal introduction. Thank you so much and uh, good afternoon. I am delighted to be able to welcome Dr. Doug White um, to give the lecture today. He is the UPMC Endowed Professor of Ethics in Critical Care, ethic, for Ethics in Critical Care Medicine. He received his MD from UCSF, um, as well as a master's degree in epidemiology and biostatistics and did a fellowship in bioethics under Bernie Lowe, someone many of us here know well. He joined the University of Pittsburgh in 2009 in the departments of critical care medicine and medicine and directs the University of Pittsburgh program on ethics and decision making in critical illness. His research encompasses both empirical uh, research on and normative analysis, ethical analysis of surrogate decision making for patients with life threatening illness. And we'll be talking to us today about challenges with surrogate decision making for acutely ill incapacitated patients. Thanks so much for being here. Yeah. Fantastic. Deborah, thank you for that nice introduction. And Jeff, thank you as well. It's really an honor to be here as part of the. Um, the named lectureship. I enjoyed hearing about uh, Miss Hutzler Reeves and the the legacy that she and her mother have left behind for Hopkins. And it's, you know, it's wonderful that there is space created at the university to focus on issues, uh, both ethical and practical issues in palliative medicine. So, again, a, a real honor to be here. All right. So, let me clear this frame here. We're recording. Okay, wonderful. So these are, oh, well, I think I just turned, there we go. These are my financial disclosures, none of which pose a conflict with what I'll be talking about today. And here are the, the 
three things I'd really like to talk about in the next 35 or 40 minutes. Uh, I want to make sure we have time for conversation too. So first, I'll address several ethical challenges regarding surrogate decision making for acutely ill incapacitated patients. And then that will lead into some exploration of what is the work that we actually ask surrogate decision makers to do to effectively carry out that role. And then finally, I'll make the case largely through ex exploring empirical evidence that the way we've been thinking about how to improve outcomes is flawed, or at least insufficient in its scope. All right, so let's first hit on several ethical challenges around surrogate decision making, and there are many. We won't get to all of them today. But the first, and so, so I am an adult intensive care physician for a, a portion of my scholarly and academic life. Uh, I work in a medical ICU. Um, the mortality rate in medical ICUs is about 25%. Um, most of the patients who are that sick can't speak for themselves, can't make decisions for themselves, so we look to family or others to make decisions for them. And I work with a lot of trainees, residents, med students, fellows in that space, and occasionally in the context of challenging uh, cases with surrogate decision makers, something like this comes up either on rounds or after rounds. A resident will say, listen, families don't really know what a patient would choose, and it's cruel to put them in this position. We should just make this decision and inform them of the plan. And in the more erudite uh, times, the, a fellow or resident might bring a paper to support their claim. This is the one that most often comes up. David Chalowitz and Dave Wendler um, published a systematic review around the accuracy of surrogate decision makers' judgments on behalf of patients. And what they found is that patient-designated and next-of-kin surrogates, two different, arguably different kinds of surrogates, incorrectly predict patients' end-of-life preferences about a third of the time. And they use this as the basis for their claim that we should just inform families of the decisions. So let me, by show of hands, how many people generally agree with this logic? Okay, so for those in the audience online, I'm not seeing any hands raised. That means I, I assume that people have some concerns about it. Would anyone be willing to share just qu quickly a concern or two and we'll see what, what comes up? Okay, so the click, the yeah, right. So if they, it, yes, there is some inaccuracy, but that doesn't mean that there's someone else who's more accurate. Okay, we'll talk about that. Yeah. I guess my first question: How can you evaluate what these recommend? Ah, empirically. Yeah. Well, so they they do this with patients who have capacity, and they separate them, give them vignettes, ask them you know, ask the, the patient, what would you choose in this context? And ask the surrogate, what do you think your loved one would choose in this context? And they run through a series of vignettes. That's the, that's the typical empirical exercise with a number of limitations, but that's, that is generally where these data come from. Any other concerns about this? Yeah, well, these two. Hmm. Yeah, so not just inaccuracy in the random sort, but a sort of a programmatic or systematic bias in some way or another, or maybe even a competing um, commitment to something else other than a patient-centered ethic. All right, and Deborah. Yes, okay. So a con and a conception of the good that stems from the physician's own judgments of the good rather than grounded in the patient's values. Okay, yeah, and then... Hard to know in which direction that would go, but probably that is one form of bias. And we, we do know there are some ways that doctors think systematically differently about the good, particularly near the end of life than patients. Great. Okay. So I think what the trainee is saying in this, in this situation, their implicit conceptualization or mental model is that surrogate's authority arises from their alleged privileged epistemic position. And the claim that the, the trainee is making is, well, they, they don't know what they want. The, 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 the allegation of epistemic privilege is, is false and therefore doctors should decide. And so we've already hit on, I think, some of the shortcomings in that analysis. But I think it's worth just taking a step back and talking about, well, what is the justification or justifications for family as surrogates? And Dan Brock, now almost 30 years ago, articulated five distinct justifications for families of surrogates, only one of which has to do with epistemic privilege. But that is the first and the most obvious. The idea that in theory, family members best know patients' preferences and values. They 
they've lived with the individual, they conceivably have had conversations with them, they've seen what they value and how they live their lives and are, are well positioned to um, make choices that are consistent with the patient's values and preferences. And it is in fact the case, someone raised this, that there has been one study to my knowledge comparing family members and physicians' accuracy uh, for predicting patients' preferences and uh, family members are more accurate than, than either the patient's primary care physician or um, run-of-the-mill hospital-based physicians who are shown the, the patient's advanced directive. But the other reasons I think are also important to work through. There's a what I would call a patient process preference, which is to say that most patients in the United States want their family to make goals of care decisions for them if they're incapacitated. And also, we have done a study in which we asked surrogate decision makers in the in the the sort of the mire and blood of the context of being a surrogate in an ICU. We framed out for them the situation of a value-laden decision around goals of care near the end of life and ask them what role they would like to play in it on a five-point scale with, uh, you know, I want to decide independently on one side to I want the doctor to decide independently on the other. And 95% of family members wanted to be involved in the decision-making with either full control or shared control with the physician. Only 5% wanted to cede this to the physician. So there are two levels of process preferences there. Also, uh, Arguably, at the societal level, there's an interest in promoting the family unit. Uh, the family is an extremely important social unit. This is where we, how children are raised, how values are inculcated, how individuals are supported in hard times, how older adults are cared for uh, when they need caregiving. And to carry out this role, families need some discretion. Uh, and that is part of the justification to give families uh, uh, some authority as the surrogate decision maker. Fourth, on democratic grounds, you know, this is not a full philosophical justification, but in response to this resident, one might say, listen, there is obviously conflict about how to do this. As a society, using our elected representatives, we have statutes about who should decide, and that points to families, all other things being equal, we should follow the rules established by democratic political processes. And then finally, and I think the, the one that's most controversial is, is the claim of distributive justice. And the idea here being that because families are likely, uh, short of bit, the patient, families are likely to be most impacted by decisions, uh, perhaps the grief that comes with it, perhaps a caregiving burden, perhaps major financial implications or changes in what one can do with one's own life, justice requires their involvement. And each of these is, is defeatable, but I think what's important about this is that the justification for family as surrogate is not nearly as thin uh, and as contingent as their accuracy in predicting the patient's preferences. I also want to point out that the basis of surrogate decision making is quite different than the basis, the moral basis of patient decision making. We've just talked about the core reasons that families that might justify family as surrogate. Why do we have why do we give patients the the choice of their own medical care and which is to say choosing from among available accepted options? And the bottom line, and, and this is absent with surrogates, is that patients have what are called agency moral rights. The patient is an agent, they have the capacity to choose, the, the ability to exercise their will, to, as Kant would say, to choose their ends. Agents have dignity, and di dignity involves an entitlement to make certain kinds of decisions about one's own life. But this is about making decisions for one's own life. And that, that is not the justification of surrogates. There's no analogous agency moral right uh, when a surrogate is just deciding for a patient. Okay, so this is sort of the standard thinking about in the United States, who and why should, who should make decisions and why. But I wanna point out that family as surrogate is not universal. And so this is a summary of European laws on surrogacy, who has decisional authority when a patient is hospitalized and incapacitated. Um, in this, the second column, you see this is when the patient has appointed a surrogate, and then the third column when the patient did not appoint a surrogate. And what you see is a lot of red here, which is to say a lot of physicians being legally authorized to be the decision maker, uh, particularly when the patient didn't appoint a surrogate. So in France, England, Germany, and the Netherlands, the physician in the inpatient setting is the legal attending, is the legal decision maker of record. They're supposed to involve the family or sort of family is, has an advisory role, but the ultimate decision is the physicians. And I think maybe for the discussion section, we can explore why, but there are, I think, both some important cultural and sociopolitical differences between Europe and the United States that might justify this. 
Okay, so moving away from the who, the, the next question is how or, or what evidentiary standards should surrogates use to make decisions? And does this tripartite standard look familiar to folks? This is the Brock and Buchanan uh, conceptualization that is law in essentially all 50 states in some form. It's, it's the, the AMA code of ethics articulates and recommends this approach to surrogate decision making. And the idea here is it's a lexically ordered three, three standard approach with the, the the most important or the, the most prevalent, if if present, patient's stated wishes should be followed. So that's the first standard. If the patient has articulated preferences, which is to say, said, you know, if I develop X condition, I want Y treatments. That's a directive. It's not, I want to avoid pain in my life. That is a, a desire and a narrow preference, but not a choice. So if the patient has stated a preference, that should be followed. If the patient hasn't stated a preference, what we ask surrogates to do is to use what's called the substituted judgment standard. And the idea here is that they would sort of metaphorically don the mental mantle of the patient to make the decision that they think all things considered the patient would choose. So it's a, it is a, a, an act of judgment and a, a, a bit of guessing. They, the patient did not choose, so we need to estimate based on what we know about the patient what we think they would choose. And then finally, if that's not possible, if there's really just not adequate information about the patient's values, values to, to do that work, then things default to the best interest standard, which is the idea that the, the surrogate should make the decision that they think best promotes the patient's overall interests. And so one thing that I think is, is interesting and potentially clinically important is what ethical values underpin each of these standards. The standard clinical view is that both the stated wishes uh, uh, standard and the substituted judgment standard are, are grounded in respect for patient autonomy. Certainly when, I, when I'm on rounds and I ask my trainees after they've said, well, listen, this is what the, the family thinks the patient would want, I ask them, you know, why is it important that we follow that? What, what's, the, what's the importance of, of this? And they say, well, it's respect for autonomy. That's, that's what we're trying to achieve here is to respect the patient. But the, and when you push, they say, well, respect what the patient chose or would choose. And then there becomes this bit of equivocation about it. And you don't actually have to look too far in the published literature as well to see that the, the view that... Um, so the substituted judgment standard is grounded in respect for autonomy. And I've just put up a few papers that uh, uh, approach it through that lens. And the, the sentence that I uh, stated here or listed here is from the last article, which was looking at the accuracy of surrogates judgments. And they started by saying, substituted judgment has been proposed as a method of promoting the autonomy of the mentally incapacitated patient. I think that this is a conceptual error, and I think, that, let me explain why. The, the best work on this has been done by Dan Bredney, who's at Chicago. He's a, a really wonderful political philosopher and, and thoughtful um, and engaged person in the, at the McLean Center at Chicago. So I, Dan pointed out that for a decision to be grounded in respect for autonomy, patients must have actually exercised their self-determination by formulating and communicating a choice. And that the actual reason that we ask surrogates to make substituted judgments is that patients have not exercised their self-determination. They haven't exercised their will. They haven't made a choice. There's no autonomous choice there. So we're asking surrogates to do something else that is not grounded in respect for agency or uh, self-determination. And Dan argued that what that is, is something like respect for authenticity, which is to say we want to uh, help the decisions conform with uh, the values that the patient expressed, their desires, the goal and authentic choices is that we want to have decisions that fit with who a patient is with the idea of maintaining the coherence of the patient's life. That's a very different conceptualization of the justification than respect for autonomy and the autonomy as self-determination conception. And I, I want to flag that their autonomy in broad contexts and, and as philosophers think about it is more than just self-determination, but really how clinicians look at this is it is autonomy as self-determination. So does this distinction, this autonomy authenticity distinction have any clinical relevance or is this really you know, a distinction without a difference? So I, I, I don't think that the work has fully been done here, but I think the, here's the idea is that in the United States, in particular, autonomy 
is often viewed as an unchallengeable trump. The idea here is that the patient chose this option. This is, a, this is an available, permissible, medically permissible option, so we must do it. But the question is that might authenticity carry less ethical force? If the patient actually never exercised her will, might other considerations be considered alongside authenticity, such as patient's best interests or family interests? Or I think in certain health systems, though not in the American health care system writ large, broader conceptions of distributive justice. I flag this not because it's an answered question, but I think that the work that Dan Bruddy and others did to conceptually separate out agency and authenticity paves the way for more thinking about whether this distinction is clinically important. And then finally, on the, on the thinking normatively about uh, standards for surrogate decision-making, I also want to flag that this tripartite standard of stated wishes, substituted judgment, best interest is not universal either. So th these are the um, guidance documents from the UK, from the British Medical Association for physicians and clinicians in the UK. And what's important is that the UK has a two standard approach, which is number one, stated preference standard, and number two, the best interest standard. And the, I think the clearest conceptualization of it from this publication is in the absence of a dispositive advanced directive, clinicians must consider the welfare of uh, the patient's welfare in the widest possible sense and consider the individual's broader wishes and feelings and values and beliefs. All decisions should follow careful considerations of the individual circumstances of the person and focus on reaching the, uh, the decision that is right for the person, not what is best for those around them or what the reasonable person would want. So the, in, in the British formulation, the middle substituted judgment standard has just been removed. And arguably, uh, we, again, we could maybe talk about this if there's time, um, sort of smushed into one standard that, that both wants to do what's right for the person and conceivably what is uh, best for them. And I think there may be a distinction there. Okay. So let's transition to talking about what, what is the work in the, in the real practical applied sense that surrogates do, uh, that individuals do when we ask them to engage in surrogate decision-making. And so for each of these three standards, the work is arguably a bit different, but to, for simplicity, I'll point out that when the patient has articulated prior preferences, the family's cognitive work, and that's not to say the, the, the emotional elements of it as well, but the cognitive work is distilled down to simply communicating those preferences. So the family is a bit of a mouthpiece here in, in, or a vessel that just transmits the patient's values. That's really a relatively easy and straightforward uh, um, bit of work if the, if the information is there. However, for the substituted judgment standard and the best interest standard, what is needed by families is something different. And in fact, they must exercise judgment to make decisions. There's a lot more work to be done if you're having to call on what we know about the patient's values and preferences, how they thought about this when grandma was sick, how they thought about uh, you know, what, what is the minimum life that is worth living, a much harder thing to do. And from an empirical standpoint, it's important to know which of these is the, is the most common approach and which of these is the work that surrogates need to do in order to develop interventions that are appropriately tailored to the cases. And so I, there are a couple, I think, really important studies of, uh, on this point. Uh, Joan Tino, now almost 25 years ago, looked at the advanced directives of uh, 700 hospitalized patients and, and then did a very detailed chart review of every case and asked the question, what proportion of these advanced directives were dispositive, which is to say, without interpretation, except for does it apply to the circumstance, the, the advanced directive gave the information that's needed to make the decision. And what she found is that only 3% of these advanced directives, and these were among uh, patients uh, at high risk of death with a, about a 50% six-month mortality, only 3% of the advanced directives contained dispositive information. And just by the way, that's not particularly surprising. Are you familiar with the Maryland Advanced Directive? Have you, have you looked at your, the? it's worth Googling it. It pops right up like every state's does, but the Maryland Advanced Directive, unless the patient goes above and beyond to, to put in detailed information about their particular values and preferences, asks, I think about two, but maybe three circumstances that are not particularly clinically common. One is, are they in a persistent vegetative state? And one is, uh, I believe, are they uh, 
are they essentially hospice eligible? Are they at the end of their life from a from an end stage condition? But the vast majority of people that come into hospitals are in neither of those situations. So those advanced directives are important as conversation starters, but they're not conversation finishers. And that's, I think, really important when we think about what do we need to do to support surrogates in the inpatient context. And the idea here is that the work that, that they need to do is uh, exercising judgment rather than merely serving as a medium. Okay, so over the last 15 or 20 years, a number of research groups, mine included, have looked at how well clinicians, how well and to what extent clinicians provide what we would consider basic decision support for surrogates in ICUs and in the, the general hospital wards. And the bottom line is that things, the, the state of affairs is pretty abysmal. Uh, a lot of this work has done, been done by audio recording conversations and then coding for key components of decision support. And what we and others have found is that there is frequent omission of key prognostic information such that surrogates frequently hold unduly optimistic expectations of the patient's outcome, which is, by the way, linked with more use of life support at the end of life. There's absent or incomplete elicitation of patients' values and preferences. Uh, Leslie Shuneman and Jared Chiercharo from my group have done really nice work on that. And then often a failure to disclose options other than full intensive treatment. And Yale Schenker at Pitt looked at audio recordings and found that in about a third of cases, there was no mention in the context of a patient in an ICU uh, at high risk of death, no mention, explicit mention at least, of uh, a comfort focused plan of care, a time limited trial, or any, anything other than straight continue full intensive treatment. And then finally, um, we've also seen that physicians often will decline to give recommendations when, even when families ask for one. So when a family says, what do you think, you know, what do you think we should do? Or what would you do if, in my circumstance? I think there are lots of important things to think through and how to answer that. But the answer that we often saw in this paper, and it was about 25% of the time, physicians said, you know, listen, that's my job is to give you the information and your job is to make this decision. And I think arguably that is a, a failure to really support surrogates in the ways that they're asking for. Okay, so then with that said, let's turn to looking at the work that has been done by, um, by various scholars, uh, healthcare delivery scientists, palliative care docs, ethicists to improve things. And the first one that I think is really important to start with is the support trial, not because it was the most amazing trial in the field, but because I think it gives a nice example of a particular conceptualization of what's required. And so the support trial was one of the largest healthcare delivery uh, trials it, of its kind. This was done in the, in the late 90s, so now, uh, again, almost 30 years ago. And they enrolled almost 5,000 patients who were hospitalized and at high risk of death in the next six months. It turned out that about half of them died in six months. And they, they put in place an intervention in the intervention arm, and it was a cluster randomized trial. And the intervention entailed giving physicians estimates of the patient's six-month survival, outcomes of cardiopulmonary resuscitation, and functional disability at two months. So giving them quantitative prognostic estimates derived from validated mortality prediction models or, or other functional prediction models. And then also a, a specially trained a nurse called the support nurse went to the patient if the had, patient had capacity or the family and elicited from them the patient's preferences around the use of life support and then took this information directly back to the physician. So really trying to make sure that the doctor has information about the patient's prognosis and their, love, the, the, their values and preferences. And unfortunately, this study was entirely negative, uh, no effect on any of the key outcome measures they looked at. And they're, they're sort of wonky names that they've listed here, but the, the outcomes are were the median time to uh, until a DNR order was written. DNR agreement is, does the doctor actually know what the patient's code status is? Um, undesirable states is the, the um, whether the patient died in an ICU or was in the hospital in a coma in the days preceding death. No difference there either. Uh, the proportion of patients dying with pain in the final days of life and then resource utilization. So essentially a stone cold negative trial. And I think what's important about this trial is the underlying conceptual framework for what was needed to improve outcomes 
uh, was essentially traditional decision analytic theory or what's called expected utility theory. And the, the general idea here applied to this case is that giving accurate information about the likely outcomes and the patient perceived value of these outcomes will reliably lead to optimal decisions, the decisions that will be logical and rational and utility maximizing. So this is, you know, this is sort of the, the rational actor approach. And they, these, these were very thoughtful health policy scholars who deployed this intervention. So it's not particularly surprising that this is the lens through which they viewed it. Just parenthetically, as a clinician, the standard view that, that is, I think, embedded in that uh, intervention of what's needed to support surrogates is, is quite cognitive, which is to say, it's something like, as the physician, I need to make sure the family understands the patient's prognosis, values, and treatment options. And once that's done, then they'll reliably uh, achieve good decisions. So you might say, well, listen, that was 30 years ago. There was quite a lot culturally different back then if we did the same study now or something similar or better, uh, but grounded in the same conceptual framework, the results might be different. This is a study that I, I was part of with, led by Chris Cox in which we developed a, uh, a web-based decision aid using uh, existing best practice standards for the surrogate decision makers of patients receiving prolonged mechanical ventilation in the ICUs. And this was a randomized trial in 13 US hospitals, 277 patients receiving prolonged mechanical ventilation. And the decision aid was a, a, written at a you know, sixth to eighth grade level, very simple, but went through and explained what it means to have prolonged mechanical ventilation, um, gave prognostic information that was tailored to the patient's circumstances. And we use what's called a, a wall of people to convey this information for people with low numeracy, which is, you know, you show a hundred faces and then say this, you know, highlight 20% of them to say this number would survive. And then 80%, this number would die with ongoing treatment. So really trying to make sure that the, the surrogates got information in a way that was comprehensible to them. Then there was a values elicitation portion of this where uh, over the course of a, uh, an interactive exercise, families worked through what they th knew about the patient's preferences and thought about their, the patient's values. And then finally, they were explained three different approaches or philosophies of care. Uh, uh, full intensive treatment on the one hand, full comfort focused care on the other, and a time limited trial of, of treatment on the other. So a very... Uh, I think a carefully developed intervention that still is grounded in this rational actor framework, but I arguably a much more robust test of it. And unfortunately, the intervention was again entirely negative. So, so there was no effect on patients' decisions to transition to comfort focused care, no effect on healthcare utilization, no effect on surrogate psychological outcomes at six months. And, and even concerningly from a process standpoint, the surrogate's prognostic expectations were no more accurate in the intervention or control arm, even though they got this very clear prognostic information. What I think was really important is that when you, when you sort of pull back the hood and look at some of the process data, what we found is that Surrogates were very optimistic about the patient's one-year survival compared to the model. The immediate estimate was 90% chance of one-year survival versus 56% chance in the model. And, and I think this is where things start to get really interesting. The, the choices, I, did, I don't think I mentioned this, at the end of the decision aid, the, the families were asked, you know, what, what do you think would be, given what you know now, what do you think is the treatment approach that's most consistent with the patient's values and preferences? And they, they marked it on the, the list and then they marked what they think should be done. And what we found is that 43% favored a treatment option that was more aggressive, which is to say more use of life-sustaining treatment than what they reported to be the patient's preferences. So something more going on here than just rational actors at play. And what is that? Well, I, before getting there, I want to just flag that these findings very much fly in the face of a huge amount of work on decision aids in the field. This is a Cochrane systematic review of 105 studies, 31,000 participants. The conclusion of the gist of the conclusion was across a wide variety of decision contexts, people exposed to decision aids are better informed, clearer about their values, have more accurate risk perception, and growing evidence that, that decision aids may improve values congruent choices. So it's not that decision aids are a terrible idea uh, entirely and in all circumstances, but when you really look at the kind of decisions for which decision aids have been developed, they're things like whether to undergo PSA testing, whether to uh, undergo colorectal cancer screening and then 
for a woman choosing between different birth control methods, wh which is most consistent with her values or preferences. Arguably really quite different decisions than a surrogate decision maker making a life or death decision under tight time constraints for someone else and that someone else being someone they love very much. I think it points to a couple uh, conceptual issues that the rational actor paradigm misses that are quite relevant to surrogate decision-making. And the first is the role of strong emotions. And so I wanna just flag, this is a great review article. If you're interested in going beyond thinking about expected utility theory to also think about how emotions and cognition play together when people make decisions. Fam, uh, went through a number of things, but I'll just read, I think, one important passage. Intense emotional states, such as anxiety, produce deficits in people's reasoning ability. Individuals in intensely anxious states have lower ability to recall information and organize this information, scan alternatives in a more haphazard fashion, select an option without considering every alternative, and process persuasion arguments less thoroughly, which is to say, you know, a lot of what clinicians do in, in conversations with surrogates is, is make recommendations, talk to them about why they think one option might be better than another. And these persuasion arguments when people are intensely stressed are uh, not as uh, effective. What I think this is, is th the easiest way to think about this is when individuals enter an ICU or when their loved one is at risk of death, quite often people become flooded, emotionally flooded, their cortex turns off, their reptilian brain turns on, and they have a, a lot of trouble processing the kind of information that they would need to make thoughtful patient-centered decisions. That's one part of it. I don't think that's the whole story, though. And I, there, The other part of the story is what we have gleaned from talking to surrogates about their experiences in the ICU setting. Um, what we have seen uh, through a variety of uh, qualitative interviews with surrogates about the challenges of making decisions is that it is an incredibly, it's not just that they're overwhelmed and can't process the information, it's that these are incredibly morally weighty decisions. And so one of the, the concluding remarks in the, in the paper was, surrogates experience significant emotional conflict between their desire to act in accordance with their loved one's values and preference, with their loved one's values, and one, not wanting to feel responsible for a loved one's death, and two, a desire to pursue any chance of recovery. And then I think the other part of this, in a separate study, we found that surrogates having previously felt discriminated against in the healthcare setting was strongly associated with higher odds of conflict with the physician. And I think this just calls attention to not only the intrapersonal aspects of it, but the inter and structural aspects of um, the healthcare delivery system that can um, disproportionately disadvantage certain groups. So along with Nick Dion Odom, uh, we put forward a uh, a viewpoint in JAMA in which we argue that decision support that focuses on medical facts alone mistakenly treats the act of deciding for others as a purely cognitive exercise rather than one that also entails emotional and psychological dimensions and called for the development and testing of interventions that not only focus on good information giving, but also on attending to strong emotions so that surrogates can actually process the information, and then also attending to the psychological and moral emotional barriers that can get in the way of making patient-centered decisions. So I'm just going to take you through two trials that uh, I think are proof of principle that there is promise to this approach. The first is by uh, my mentor, Randy Curtis, who, who recently died of ALS. Um, he and his colleague did a multi-center randomized trial among, again, among critically ill patients with acute respiratory failure at high risk of death. And essentially what they did is they added to the ICU team another um, role. They added what they call the communication facilitator. So when you think about changing clinical practice. This is bringing a whole other person onto the already complicated ICU team. This individual was trained in family support and mediation th therapy. And the idea is that he or she de delivered tailored support day after day to the families based on their coping styles, uh, facilitated communication with the team. And then as conflict was arising, was able to preemptively address it and support surrogates in ways that he or she judged appropriate. And what they found is that, uh, the impact on, it was a generally positive trial. They found that it did have impact on um, patients, I'm sorry, on surrogates, symptoms of uh, psychological distress at six months. So lower symptoms of depression uh, and PTSD at six months, no effect on anxiety. They also found that it uh, decreased ICU length of stay among decedents. So a very big decrease in the length of stay 
that came along with a decrease in the total hospitalization costs. And what I want to flag about that I forgot to mention about the support trial and the others is that there, look at the disconnect between the, the ethical issues that we've been looking at, which is around patient-centered care, golden cordon care, and the kind of outcomes that are in most of these trials. Like nowhere has there been an outcome that really gets at, was this care consistent with the patient's values and preferences? And this is, I think, a huge methodological issue for, for the field. And it, it really hinges on the difficulty of quantifying goal concordant care. Okay, and then I'm gonna end by just talking about the results of this randomized trial that we published in 2018. And this was a, a very different kind of intervention. So rather than adding something, someone to the ICU team, this was uh, what we called a, an ICU level intervention in which we trained and retrained existing clinicians in the ICU and put in different family support, uh, put in a different family support pathway to support families. This was a stepped wedge cluster randomized trial, which is to say the ICU rather than the patient was the unit of randomization. And the randomization was the time at which each ICU shifted from intervention to control. That's what a, a stepped wedge cluster randomized trial is. We enrolled 1,420 patients, critically ill patients at high risk of death or disability and their surrogates. And then the outcome measures that we looked at, and this is where we tried to get closer to this goal concordant care construct, but did not get there because the, the measure doesn't exist. We, we measured surrogates long-term psychological distress. We used a metric called the patient centeredness of care. It was the, a look back family report of the extent to which care was centered on the patient's values. Good, but not great as a measure the quality of clinician family communication, and then healthcare utilization outcomes. And the intervention, as I briefly described, was a multi-component family support intervention delivered by the interprofessional ICU team with a much bigger role given to the ICU nurses. So nurses were trained to every day uh, align with the families, to work with the families, to deliver um, tailored emotional support to make sure that the, the, they were, the families were getting their questions answered, and then also to, to have timely clinician family meetings that the nurses attended. And this is the, sort of the layout over time. It's, I, I know it's hard to see, but on the x-axis is the time in the ICU, day one, day two, day three, and then on the, on the uh, above it is the description of what happened. The idea being that was a, there was a clinician family meeting within 48 hours, and then at least every five to seven days thereafter. And the, the, we called them the partner nurses, did a great deal of work with the families, both before the family meetings, during the family meetings, to make sure that the family's needs and concerns were being addressed, as well as the patient's values and preferences, and then working with the families after the meetings to help them process what came up. Much more to be said about the nature of this intervention. But what I wanted to highlight is that, interestingly, the intervention had no impact on surrogate decision makers' psychological distress, which is to say it didn't improve things, but it didn't worsen things. That's, I think it's both a, um, we'd like to see that it uh, decreased distress, but we were heartened to see that it did not increase it because several interventions in the field have, we, by, by really bringing surrogates more into the, we think, by bringing them more into the awareness of how sick their loved one is and, and really how much is at stake. But every other outcome measure that we looked at was positively affected by the intervention. So family members' ratings of the quality of communication were significantly higher. Family members' ratings that the care delivered was consistent with the patient's values and preferences were significantly higher in the intervention arm. And then in terms of healthcare utilization, what we found is much less use of invasive life support among dying patients. So both a shortening of the, the overall ICU length of stay and the hospital length of stay. And then this came with a concomitant decrease in um, total hospitalization costs. And I think I, I <laughs> there's lots to talk about around, do we actually save money with end of life care interventions? I think it's an important conversation. I felt it was really important to collect these data to make, if it's positive, to make the case, the value case to healthcare leaders and CEOs and CMOs of hospitals that the intervention not only uh, does good things for families, but, but also is financially feasible. Okay, and then I'm just gonna end by uh, uh, summarizing a trial that is going on right now that we're leading uh, out of pit. This is, it's not bringing a different member onto the ICU team. It's not retraining the ICU team. It's a proactive involvement and early integration of palliative care consultants into the care of patients at high risk for death or severe functional impairment. This is a patient level randomized trial. We're conducting it at five different in five different ICUs at UPMC. And the outcome measures that we're looking at are the ones that I think are, again, at least 
getting at the things that we, ethically we think are important. So we have a measure of goal concordant care. We're looking at patients' clinical outcomes, healthcare utilization, surrogates, six-month anxiety, depression, and PTSD. And the idea is that palliative care specialists are particularly trained to diagnose essentially what, what are the struggles that surrogates are having. Is it, um, is it informational issues? Is it emotional distress? Or are there real moral dilemmas that they're facing? and then delivering the kind of tailored care that we uh, hypothesize may improve outcomes. Okay, so I have a few more slides if we wanna to get to them, but I'm gonna stop here just so we have time for discussion. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Super, super interesting. Um, just a quick comment about um, autonomy versus authenticity, which is a distinction I'm also very interested in. Um, some contemporary work now on autonomy suggests that it's not autonomy versus authenticity, but two yeah. dimensions of autonomy. Autonomy as self-determination versus autonomy as authenticity. Yeah. It actually suggests, the current literature suggests that it's autonomy as authenticity that matters morally more than autonomy as self-determination. So it actually carries carries more moral weight than, than the self-determination stuff. Yeah. So, so I think it's a good direction to take. So that's just as a general comment. And then to say that- Can I, can I ask you yeah. one thing about that? So yeah, sure. I, I, I have, I'm somewhat familiar with that literature. Um, I, I certainly agree that autonomy is not as narrow a construct as self-determination. There's much more that can go into it. In the context of surrogate decision-making, what's tricky is, is, is self-determination necessary? but not sufficient to say that something is autonomous, which is to say, if there's really, if there was no act of the will, what is the, what is the work that surrogates are doing and how does that further autonomy? I think some, I, I'm, this is not uh, entirely my comfort zone, but I, I think some of the current authors would say, yes, you can have autonomy without self-determination. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, um, but I just also wanted to say that I wonder, and, and this is actually a question for you is, um, so we know that um, surrogate decision makers are not super accurate when it comes to autonomy. Do we have any reason to be more optimistic about authenticity or yeah. it will be the same, yeah, the same I, mistakes about authenticity that they make about self-determination? So great question. I, I don't have an answer. This is, you know, empirically, it, that study has not been done. But I, the concern that I have about the existing empirical literature, well, am, among others, is that the the way that the outcomes assessed is assuming that there is one right answer and pushing surrogates to say, well, among these options, which would they have chosen? And I, I, I think that you are right in hinting that there may be quite a lot of um, inaccuracy in that. And I, I think a better way to look at it would be to, to actually ask the question a different way to say, wh which of these options do you think would be really inconsistent with what your loved one might choose for themselves. Because I, I think that there's probably a range of decisions that are permissible and plausible that the surrogate might choose given all of the variability that comes up in, in what I think of as in the moment decision-making. You know, most people don't carry around formulated preferences for foreign decisions in their mind. And instead we const what's called construct our preferences in the moment. And so I, you know, a lot of the work around preference construction has shown that the way that questions are asked and, and when and by whom construct, preference construction is facilitated can substantially affect that. And so, so yes, I, I'm just, when a patient has not so selected a, a treatment, I am quite skeptical of this focus on trying to pick the one that they would have chosen. We have one question in the chat right now. Can you comment on the role of the chaplain in any of the studies yes. you presented that is partner role? Yes, great question, chaplaincy. So we, the, I don't know if the person on who asked the question um, is aware, but there was just a randomized trial published of a, a single center chaplaincy intervention. And that's why I didn't um, present it as I think it's very preliminary, but chaplaincy arguably is um, in, the, in, in the hospital context, one of the, specialties or professions most prepared to attend to the, the moral dimensions of these care decisions that can be so difficult for surrogates. And so this randomized trial um, 
done by Lexi Tork at Indiana showed preliminary evidence of decreases in surrogate psychological distress and improvements in ratings of goal concordance of care with a chaplaincy delivered intervention. And we're actually right now in the, in the midst of putting together um, a larger grant application to do to test it in a multi-centered trial. Yes, yeah, so st stay tuned on that. All right, we have one more question in the chat. Thanks for the great talk. Could you please say a bit more about what ethical value or importance to give to clinicians being able to live with the decisions that they're involved with and the cumulative impact of decisional burden over the course of their career? Have there been noteworthy differences between countries that place more or less emphasis on the clinician's role in decision making? Mm. Yeah, great questions. Great set of questions. So last, first, and the easiest I'm not aware of any studies that look at this, and I think that look at the, the decisional burden on clinicians and whether it varies from country to country based on the role that they play, I think it would be hard to disentangle those things too because it, the reasons that, that doctors have different roles in different countries are arguably much substantially tied up in ethical norms and cultural norms uh, for each of those countries that differ. Um, let's see, the first part of that question, Anne, will you read the first part again, please? Could you please say a bit more about what ethical value or importance to give to clinicians being able to live with the decisions that they're involved with and the cumulative impact of decisional burden over yeah. the course? Of okay, so the, yeah, the, 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 we're getting into the realm of um, claims of conscience and clinicians being a party to decisions that they find morally problematic. You know, I think, I think there are gradations. One of the things that, in working with trainees that uh, has been, for me is the marker of a, of a maturing clinician is when they can say, listen, this is not a decision that I would make for myself, but I can see why this person based on their values is making that decision. That, that is not easy for people to do to say, what's important to me is not what's fully important to you. And, and I respect that. But I have found that that when clinicians get there, it allows them to, be a part of treatment plans that they don't particularly agree with for themselves, but see as um, good medical care for the patient. That's number one. I, I would say the second part of this is that there are certainly circumstances in which patients or families may be asking for things that clinicians believe are just deeply inappropriate. And in those circumstances, I do think that it's important for clinicians to be able to say, I, I can't be part of that. And to seek uh, an accommodation to remove themselves from care. That's not the same as saying, the, the clinician saying, listen, I can't be part of that and therefore we're not going to provide it. This is a, a, a claim of conscience in which the clinician seeks to remove him or herself from care while the, the requested care is being provided by another clinician. Uh, the trials you described at the end of your talk are fascinating, and I just want to hear more about the kind of support that's provided by nurses or palliative palliative care team to family members. So if um, you know, a family member is struggling because they see the decision as a morally weighty decision, like how exactly are they supported yeah. in making yeah. that? Yeah, so great question. Like what, what is the active yeah. ingredient? And in, in, that is a question that's, I think, broadly one that is uh, on the mind of uh, clinicians and researchers in the field now is how can we really characterize the nature of the intervention that's delivered so that it can be scaled if it's or disseminated appropriately if it's positive. Um, this is this, yeah, the slide is still up. So what you can't read here, these are the, the, the intervention that we're testing is grounded in ex existing guidelines for what high quality palliative care in the inpatient setting should and contain. And it lists a few things. So first managing distress, patient's distress from physical and psychological symptoms, attending to spiritual needs, providing timely patient and family centered communication about goals of care, aligning treatment plan with patient preferences, attending to families' needs and concerns, and then coordinating care plans. But the, the, the so that's, that's what it's meant to be. There's a lot of variability about and how different clinicians deliver it. And there's case-to-case -case variability because obviously different patients and families come with different strengths and weaknesses. And the goal of the intervention is to be tailored to, to that. But your question about, you know, what do they do with um, 
the, the moral concerns that can come up is I, I would say the first thing that they do, and, and this has been my experience being a clinician as part of these interventions. So I've actually had a sev several of my patients that I've been the ICU attending for has had a palliative care consult as part of the intervention. And what I see that the intensive or the palliative care docs do well is they they actually start by engaging in the, the, the questions of, you know, t tell me about what what about this decision is, is difficult for you. What I, I hear things coming up for you. Let's talk about that. And so the first thing being unearthing the moral concerns. And then one of the things that I have seen them do very well is helping families reframe the things that they're feeling guilty about as acts of respect when the decision is one that seems consistent with the patient's values and preferences. And so this is the idea that you know, families will remember these decisions for the rest of their lives. And as long as the clinicians feel that the family is making decisions that are consistent with the patient's values and preferences, then the work to be done is to, is to help them leave that experience, not feeling guilty about that, but instead feeling that what they did was a, a gesture of love and respect. And that sometimes that simple reframing is enough. But, but I, would, I would say that the question you ask is just the right question about, well, you know, let's really figure out from a psychological standpoint, what are the counseling techniques that can be most effective in these contexts? And then the, the next set of work is to figure out to what extent can we actually train clinicians to do these things or, or is it too specialized a skill? You know, I, we have a we have a proposal, a grant right now, uh, in which we're developing um, scalable coaching interventions for clinicians to using deliberate practice techniques to help them develop the skills to support surrogates. And we are in the midst of evaluating the extent to which surrogate uh, physicians can actually do that work of engaging on hard moral questions with families. Can they be taught to do it with a you know a, a relatively brief intervention? So stay, stay tuned, we'll see. Thank you. Well, thank you, Doug. I guess one question I had is maybe building off the second set of questions that Anne was reading for us is what evidence, if any, do we have about the impact of these interventions on clinicians and their experiences with moral distress or others? Yeah, yeah. So that that is an outcome measure that has uh, not been a focus of most of these studies. In the partner trial, we um, we did qualitative interviews with the nurses who were part of it, and, and and also the doctors. But what we found qualitatively of the nurses is they loved the intervention because it helped them practice to their scope of competence. You know, a lot of nurses in the in the acute care context feel sidelined. They feel that the doctors run the show, that they disregard their expertise, that they that the nurses have all of this, not only. Um, skill, but also knowledge about the patient and family that just kind of doesn't make it in when the doctor kind of blows in, sits down with the family, tells them what's going on, engages in surrogate decision making, and then leaves and maybe tells the nurse what happened, but doesn't really engage the nurse. And what we found is that the nurses, if the healthcare delivery uh, can be arranged so that they can actually sit with the families, so, so the space is created for them to do that, which is no small feat. But if that can be done in a way that doesn't make the, the nurse's job just one more thing to be done, they loved it. They loved the, the, the work of engaging with families. Um, we were careful about who we selected because not all nurses are, are ready for this or have the, um, the disposition to do it well. So I'm not sure that this is the kind of intervention you would expect every nurse in every clinical unit to be able to do. But to find that the lead the leader nurses, the senior nurses who really understand the the territory and can engage with these issues, uh, I think is quite promising. Just a follow up on that. What then happened after the intervention at these yeah. sites? Yeah, yeah. So even before the trial came out, um, it, before the trial was published in the New England Journal, the health system said we are going to scale this across all forty ICUs in the health system, and so that was now five years ago. And they have invested probably three or four hundred thousand dollars a year in the staff to go out to these ICUs to initially train them, and then to do ongoing maintenance, monitoring, audit, and feedback of the extent to which the intervention is being delivered. And it has it has persisted, so it's it's still there, which is you know, a, a, it is one of the the beauties of doing this kind of research in a large health system, which is. Well, there's two things. It's one of the beauties of doing it in a large health system. It also points to 
the importance of being able to make the economic argument to uh, CMOs that this thing will not cost the health system money and might even save the health system money. We have one last question in the chat, sorry. It's been waiting for a little bit. Do you have any sense of how your conclusions shift in crisis conditions, e.g. managing surrogate decision-making during the COVID pandemic? Oh, it's a great question. I mean, I, I, part of this is the, the extent to which, and this is something we didn't really talk about today, but I think is important, is that we haven't talked about where and when the patient-centered ethic ends and when other regarding considerations come into play, right? A lot of what we talked about was very much assuming a patient-centered ethic, the doctor is doing what's right for this patient in front of him or her. The crisis standard of care bring up, bring up situations in which we cannot deliver patient-centered care to everyone. So I, I would say that that's the first distinction is that there are different rules that uh, are applied when we can't deliver the, the life-saving care to everyone. Um, we have done some work on how this happened during the pandemic. And what we found was, a, and, and I mean by this, not around crisis standard of care so much as around what did it look like when families were not in the hospital? Uh, and a lot of, this was, a, you know, again, an interesting perturbation of the system. There was, we found a huge shift to um, video conferences and to teleconferences. We, there's a study that I didn't, one of the ones I was going to show you, but I didn't was around families' perspectives and doctors' perspectives on it. Families loved it. They loved being able to not have to come into the hospital all the time to get to have a video conference, to have a teleconference. And I, I would just remind you that it wasn't, I think pre-pandemic, there was this feeling amongst many clinicians that if the family wasn't coming into the hospital, they may not really care about their loved one. And that's a problematic assumption, especially for communities uh, who are low, have low socioeconomic resources and can't get to the hospital because of either caregiving burdens or financial considerations where they don't have a car. And I think the, the pandemic really changed that. And now there's a, a much more of a view that family members can be quite engaged and not in the hospital. And so that, that's a plus. I, I, I don't wanna to be too rosy about how awful it's been in ICUs in the pandemic and how, and it is quite hard when patients die without families at their side. This is, I would say, just one of the, the things that I hope we will continue to work with, which is to say, using technology to help families when they can't be in the hospital and still support them. Right, thank you so much. Please join me in thanking Dr. White.